Hello and welcome. My name is Jessica Adelman and I work in social media and communications for the Ehlers Down the Society and I will be your moderator today. For our webinar today, we have Dr. John Medikaitis presenting on EDS and TMJ. This webinar is part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD. A quick note on how this webinar is going to work. Attendees are muted at all times. However, you are able to type questions into the question box at any time. Dr. Medikaitis will not be able to see or respond to any questions until the Q&A time at the end of his presentation. Please do not send your question more than once as it will not increase the chance your question will be answered. It'll only make it harder for us to sift through those questions. Dr. John Medikaitis is an expert in the field of craniofacial pain and TMJ disorder with a special focus on craniofacial pain and dental manifestations in the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome patient. He is a member of the Oral and Mandibular Manifestations Working Group of the International Consortium on Ehlers-Danlos and Related Disorders. Dr. Medikaitis is a diplomat of the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain, the highest level of achievement awarded by the AACP. He is also a diplomat of the American Board of Craniofacial Dental Sleep Medicine. Dr. Medikaitis is the founder of the TMJ Treatment Center, where he leads a highly trained and qualified team of professionals with advanced TMJ certification. He is a frequent lecturer at national and international conferences in the area of TMJ and craniofacial pain diagnosis and treatment techniques. Thank you so much for being here today. Okay, thank you very much, Jessica, and I'm happy to be here to join in the group to find out what's going on. So I'm going to flip off here and show you the slides so questions will come in at the end of the presentation. I appreciate that. Now, basically what we're going to be talking about is TMJ, cervical cranial instability and hypermobility in the EDS patient. As far as management goes, we're probably not gonna have enough time to go through complete management, but we'll actually touch on that a little bit. Okay, so Jessica, I gotta be able to move down. Now, there we are, this is me, okay. Uh, the good news and the bad news is this is what I do. We actually do work I uh, with Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Greater Baltimore Medical Center, and I work with Dr. Rodney Graham in London occasionally. And we, I am also the uh, Ohio expert on the Ohio Dell Board for uh, facial fillers and Botox. We end up doing a lot of migraines. This is our disclaimer. Everything we're telling you has to be qualified before you actually treat any patient. Now, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction in the ehlers danlos patient, we'll cover this. Basically, EDS, as we know, varies from patient to patient. The diagnosis for similar patients, while being similar, should actually be verified by the genetic testing. We all know that. We want you to stay within treatment parameters of treatment. And this lecture also concentrate on specific pain referral syndrome, the cervical myofascial pain syndrome, which we will talk about at the, uh, towards the end. Again, here we are parameters. Note that the syndromes to be explained are after complete testing and we have no life threatening conditions. Number two, the cervical myofascial pain syndrome is a syndrome that I've personally coined and we actually tracked 200 Ehlers-Danlos patients. And of those 200 Ehlers-Danlos patients, 195 had this syndrome. So I would consider the two being fairly integral. And what you're also going to find out is that the cervical myofascial pain syndrome is in direct association and correlation with TMJ dysfunction and cervical cranial instability syndromes. All syndromes are usually correlated. So here we go. Let's talk about Ehlers-Danlos first. I'm not going to qualify this because there are geneticists that are more qualified about you, about this to actually explain it, but we'll just touch upon the fact that it is, as we know, a hereditary collagenous syndrome, and it is caused by chromosomes and gene sites that are compromised. And we know that it compromises virtually everything in your body. Some people are more affected than others. And the gene sites include the COL1A1, 1A2, 3A1, 5A1, 5A2, Adam TS2, and TMX genes. But what we're going to find out about a year and a half ago, we had a seminar, an international conf uh, conference in New York with 
the actual geneticists and treatment, quote unquote, experts that actually treated TMJ and EDS. And the one thing we found out was we were actually up to 74 to 78 different gene sites. We also found out that we were working at two chromosome sites, which is chromosomes 15 and 13. Okay. Keep in mind, and we stated this before, if you need testing, it has to be done by classification and biochemical gene testing. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, the classifications in a year and a half ago were actually changed. So if you're actually, if somebody says you're type 3 or type 4, all that has been changed. That's the old syndrome. So what we have now for the new classifications is we're talking about hypermobile vascular or classic, AD, classic EDS syndrome. And we'll also find out that there's H, C, and V EDS designations. So let's talk about TMJ. What is TMJ? The TMJ is the joint that actually articulates your jaw to your skull, right in front of your ear. And what you find out is when you open your mouth, that jaw actually hinges and, and uh, slides. It actually is a dual motion joint. We'll talk about that in a minute. But under normal function, when you open your mouth, you should be able to open it 40 to 55 millimeters, okay? There should be no deviations. In other words, when you look in the mirror, your jaw should not go off from side to side. You shouldn't have any pain when you open your mouth. You shouldn't have any popping or cracking in the joint. When you chew, it should be normal. You shouldn't have to move your jaw in an aberrant position. And the one thing that I usually have you do if you're at one of my lectures, I have you put your fingers just in front of the, your ears on both sides and have you open your mouth. When you do that, the jaw condyles, in other words, the heads of your jaw should move laterally one and a half to two millimeters. When they don't, that's usually an indication that the joint is displaced. And you can come see me this summer in Baltimore and we'll talk about possibly fixing that. Okay, so what is not normal in a TMJ patient? So what's not normal is number one, your mouth opening is limited. In other words, you can't get those Big Macs in there. You can only get your finger mouth open one or two fingers. When you open your mouth, the deviation we talked about is intact. In other words, your jaw will actually swing from side to side. Or you can get cracking or crunching or grinding when you actually open your mouth. Or popping, quote unquote. You find yourself having problems chewing or being able to actually physically put your teeth together. You'll hit, be hitting one area or one tooth. Uh, before you hit the rest, okay? And you'll have headaches. Now, we're going to talk about headaches in a minute, but the headaches can come in about three or four different forms. Usually with TMJ, we're going to show you the muscles that actually generate the headaches, and there's actually a cervical component that will actually generate headaches along with this. Now, you'll also have ear pain in some cases. Now, ear pain basically can be in front of the ear, in the ear, under the ear, it's all part of the syndrome, but what you're going to find out is that the same nerve that actually physically supplies the joint in question actually goes to the ear canal, okay? So that's why we get a lot of referrals from ENTs and or uh, general doctors because they look in your ear and don't see a thing wrong, and then we figure out that it's not the ear itself, but it is a TMJ. Now, the one thing we do notice and we're going to talk about later is we're going to talk about limited cervical motion. In other words, you have limit in motion of your head turning from side to side or looking up and down, and we'll talk about the limitations there. We're also going to talk about muscle spasms and those spasms the lateral side of your head, anterior throat, and anterior portion of your throat, the back of your neck, uh, all areas that can actually be um, initiated by malposition of the jaw and or motion of the joint itself. So let's talk about things that actually can cause you discomfort. Number one, let's talk about the muscles and how they work. Now, the muscles in your face and head are all closer muscles, believe it or not. The one in the side of your head that we see right here is called the temporalis muscle. And that's like a big fan. You have the anterior, middle, and posterior section of the temporalis muscle. If you have pain in the anterior section, Basically, your jaw is actually pulling forward. 
pain in the center, that means you've been clenching like a bandit. And pain in the rear means the jaw is, is being retruded. Now, the master muscle right here is the one in your cheek, and that actually generates pain at the angle of your jaw and up in your cheek itself. Okay. And this is the one that will actually put pain into the teeth. Okay. Now, the internal pterygoid actually is at the angle of the jaw, and it's the one at the back angle of your mandible, and it'll give you pain underneath the angle of the jaw and up in the lateral portion of your throat. The external pterygoid muscle is the muscle that actually attaches to the area in the joint itself right here. The superior head goes to the piece of cartilage that interposes between the two bones. The inferior head goes to the condyle itself. So when you move your jaw from side to side or open, this is the muscle that actually gives the primary impetus to that motion. Now, if you get an occasional sharp pain in the joint itself, a lot of times it's because of spasm of this external pterygoid muscle. Also, a lot of times if it spasms, it can actually physically pull the cartilage out of place, and that's when your opening is limited. Okay. Now, there are other muscles that are actually in the lower portion of the jaw, underneath the angle of the jaw. This is the anterior belly and the posterior belly of the digastric muscle, the omohyoid, the superior and middle pharyngeal constrictor muscles, and we're going to talk about those and how they interplay in this situation. <clears throat> Keep in mind, too, that when we talk about TMJ, a lot of TMJ patients have discomfort in the back of their heads. Now, the internal oblique, the rectus capitis minor, the trapezius, the semispinalis capitis, and the levator scapulae muscles are all muscles that are actually inserted in the rear of the head from behind the mastoid process all the way to the center. And basically, they help determine your head position, anterior and posterior, and your cervical cranial stability. And these will, we'll, we're going to find out that the position of the head and the position of the neck and the jaw are all interrelated. Same thing, situation with the position of the head itself. Now, let's actually talk about the structure of the joint itself. Now, this is a little bit too complex to, for words, but. Basically, this is a synovial joint. In other words, there's fluid in between the joints. So if you look superior, inferior, posterior, and inferior, there's superior synoviums, inferior synoviums, posterior, inferior synoviums, and posterior superior synoviums. All those will generate pain when, in fact, the condyle, this structure right here, is out of position. Okay. Now, another situation you get into is that you got posterior lamina tissues, so if the head of the condyle is pushed to the rear, in other words, if you close, you hit the, hit the back of your front teeth, and before you hit your back teeth, the jaw will actually move to the rear and compress this posterior lamina. <clears throat> and when that happens, that's when you get the fullness and the itching in the in the ear itself. Okay. Now, the retrodiscal tissue is that tissue in the same area. Now, this is the temporal mandibular joint ligament itself, and it goes across the joint, and it's the one that actually gives you discomfort just below your orbit and the lateral portion just above the cheek, and that's where that discomfort comes from. Okay. Now, this structure is what they call the, la the uh, lateral collateral ligament. This is what holds the cartilage in place from the outside. The medial collateral ligament right here holds it in place from the inside. Tanaka's ligament holds the condyle in place from the inside, which you can't see. And also you have the temporal bone, you have the mastoid process, which is back here, and the articular eminence, which is right here. Now, all these structures can generate discomfort. The most common, though, is retrodiscal and the synovium, superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior, okay? So let's talk about the joint and how it actually works. Basically, this is what they call a ganglomo-arthroidal joint. In other words, it has two motions. It rotates for the first 33 millimeters of opening around the pivot point right here. And then as you open wider, the whole condyle moves down the joint. And this cartilage right here should stay interposed between the two. Okay. Now, this is your ear hole. This is your mastoid process where your sternocleidomastoid muscle comes off. This is the articular eminence, and that's the back portion of your cheek right here. So as you keep in mind, there are three patterns. It's coronal, sagittal, and transverse pattern. 
We talked about it being a synovial joint, okay? And we've also talked about, if we're talking about central collation, this is more for dentists than anyone else. Central collation, people assume that it's a bite. It's actually the positioning of the bones one to another. Now, the one situation we talked about before, and we're going to talk about it again, the pre and post vertebral musculature determine the jaw position. In other words, where the neck is determines where the jaw is, and where the head position is depends the, uh, determines where the jaw will rest. So in other words, everything is interrelated. So let's go over this one more time. Here's the condyle. Here's the articular surface. Here's the meniscus. Here's the superior portion of the external pterygoid muscle. This is the inferior portion. When you open your mouth, this muscle interacts and this muscle interacts and pulls everything forward. When this is displaced, it'll displace usually forward and be actually be lodged in here. So this condyle will move up and actually be blocked by the posterior portion of the, of the meniscus itself. And you can't get your mouth open. So let's talk about the neurology. And this is, we're gonna do this simply, nothing exciting. But basically the trigeminal nerve runs the TMJ itself, basically. So with it, what you end up with is the V1, which is the superorbital portion of the trigeminal nerve. and actually exits right above the eye, right here in its sensory. V2 exits in the inferior portion and it is also sensory. V3 is a mandibular situation. It comes down the jaw, out the uh, middle foramen, and actually goes to the chin. Now, keep in mind that V1 and 2 are all sensory. They're, they're input. Whoops, let's go back. Wrong direction. Okay, they're all sensory. Okay. Now, all muscles of mastication are run by V3. So it's the temporalis, the, the masseter. The internal pterygoid and the external pterygoid are all run by <clears throat> V3. Now, keep in mind that the anterior belly of the digastric, that's the muscle underneath your chin, and the lateral rectus muscle of your eye, what? The lateral rectus muscle of your eye, that's the muscle that abducts your eye. In other words, when you look to the side, that is run by the trigeminal nerve. So believe it or not, input with pain and or muscle position or spasm can actually cause blurring of vision by actually activating that lateral rectus muscle in your eye. Interesting. Now, the trigeminal nerve also has branches that go down the C2 in your neck, and they go as far down as L2 in your back. Very interesting. So pain in your neck can actually produce pain in your jaw, the lateral portion of your head. Um, it's Everything actually works back and forth. And the reason it works like this, there's a thing called convergence mechanism. In other words, in other words, you can have pain in one position and it will actually generate pain in another. We're going to find out that pain in the master muscle, which is right here, can actually generate pain to what they call the superior pharyngeal constrictor, which actually cause pain in your throat and actually reduce the air, the, the pharyngeal volume, and actually reduce your air volume and actually make you snore at night when you clench your teeth. Interesting stuff, huh? All right, nociceptive pain is when the source of pain is in one place and the, and the site of pain is in another. So you can actually have pain in the lateral portion of your neck and the pain will actually appear in the anterior portion of your skull. So the source of pain is in one place and the site of pain is in some in another place. So let's talk about cervical cranial instability. Now, basically what happens is it has to do with the posture of the head and the support of the cervical spine. So as a basic rule of thumb, number one, your head posture it should be to the point where your ear, your shoulder, and your hips should all should be on the same line. You see where we're actually anterior, and we're actually anterior here at this point by about three to four inches. Now, for every two inches the head goes forward, it actually doubles the weight of the head itself. So basically what it does is it puts strain on the ligaments, tendons, and muscles of the neck and upper back. So that's where a lot of that comes from. Now, the position of the jaw is dictated by the position of the head and the, uh, and the position of the uh, upper cervical spine. So you can see actually it retrudes here and the ligaments length and strength are actually stretched and put under tension. Again, the pre and post vertebral musculature determines the jaw position, cervical cranial wrist position dictates the mandibular position. 
It is all related. Okay, let's talk about diagnostics. Now, we were talking about the head position of the head. Now, what causes the discomfort at the base of your skull and referral pain and headaches from the base of your skull that were referred to your head? Number one, what, they, what tends to happen is that there are a set of three ligaments, okay, that are actually interposed between your upper cervical spine and the back of your head. The atlas, number one, when you test it, you're actually testing the transverse ligament itself. Basically, if you turn your head from side to side and say no, basically what happens is that actually will tell you what that positioning of the C1 at the position, uh, vertebrae is and how the action of the transverse ligament is. The crucial ligament is your yes ligament. So if you take your head and move it up and down like you're saying yes, that will tell you the, the condition of that ligament. And the alar ligament, which is, I don't know, it's your side bending head ligament, actually dictates and shows you the position of C2. So basically, you have three ligaments that will actually dictate the position of C1 and C2. If you cannot look up, or if you can't look from side to side, or if you get cracking or crunching, you do that. A lot of times, there's positioning of the vertebrae and actually weakening of those ligaments. So what we find out is actually C2 is the corner, cornerstone of all this. C1 is a big washer. C2 has a vertical process called the dens. And basically what happens is, is that dens dictates where C1 goes. So what we're going to see in a minute, the anterior positioning of the mouth with the coronal image is going to show rotation in this next slide. And the space will increase and, and deflect. So let's look at this and see what we see. If you look at the first slide, you see where the spacing is good. So what you're seeing here is the dens or the vertical portion of C2. <coughs> These are the lateral portions of C1. So you see the spacing is even. But the big thing to look at is look at the horizontal process of the mandible. Okay, so if we look at the second slide, the head C2 is actually rotated to the right and the tail is to the left. Do you see the increase in spacing here? But what's interesting is to see the deflection of the mandible itself. Okay, what causes that? We're going to find out in a minute. Okay, so if the C2 is out of position, the mandible will actually physically deflect and your bite will be off. Interesting stuff. Going the opposite direction, if we're rotated to the left, the space is increased on the left-hand side. You see where the mandible is deflected this way now. It's higher on the right than it is on the left. So basically what happens is, the position of C2 will position the mandible and vice versa. So mandible affects C2, C2 affects the mandible. Don't forget it because it is very important. Now, this is just a little piece of trivia here. If you open your mouth and say, ah, see this arch right here? This is the anterior arch of C1, okay? So if you look at this, that's this arch right here okay oops right there so what oops keep doing that and this arch is what actually will protrude in the rear of your throat when the anterior when the, the dens of c2 moves it forward that's why the pills get stuck so when we actually rotate c1 back in you'll actually be able to swallow better a little piece of trivia for you so we had a question, preliminary question about high, the hyoid bone and the hyoid positioning. So what tends to happen is the hyoid positioning is a situation where it actually suspends the muscles of the lower portion of your jaw, of your mandible. So the one thing we found out is that when the hyoid bone is above the hyoid plane, in other words, above the tip of the jaw, when you look at it laterally, you'll actually get what we call an anterior open bite. In other words, when you close and put your teeth together, you actually can sometimes put your finger between the upper teeth and the lower teeth. Hyoid bone retrusion can actually cause airway constriction. In other words, a hyoid bone will move posteriorly. Now, what happens is, is that the more you clench, the more you tend to move that hyoid bone superiorly into the rear. So clenching will not only cause no an anterior open bite, but it'll also cause airway constriction. In other words, it'll make you snore at night 
and or make it hard to catch your breath. It'll also make swallowing a little tougher than normal. Now, we're also going to talk about a little bit about elevator muscle activity. In other words, the more you clench your teeth, a couple of things happen. Your upper lip will actually get shorter. In other words, you'll actually see it between the base of your nose and the top of your lip. That, that space will actually become shorter and shorter, and you'll tend to lose what they call a cupid's bow, which is the heart-shaped area at the top of your lip, which causes is caused by a restriction in the motion of that uh, upper lip. The retro-inclined profile basically is, if you look in the mirror, your jaw will be retruded. In other words, it will be more towards the back of your head. So the one thing that's probably the most important of everything we're going to talk about in the next couple minutes is that increased tension from clenching basically increases the tension in the superior and middle pharyngeal constrictors. What are those? They are the muscles that actually allow you to swallow. In other words, when you swallow, this muscle actually starts in your cheek, goes around the back of your throat, and when actually constricts and puts the food down in your throat. The more you clench, the more it causes those, con those uh, superior constrictors to um, pharyngeal constrictors to actually reduce the size of your pharyngeal constriction area. So when you actually decrease the amount of clenching you do and or relax those muscles, you increase, your volume will actually increase by about 50%. And you won't get a thing called AHI, which is apneic hypopnic index, which is a, uh, a measurement of sleep uh, apnea in your uh, testing. Now, the oral plants, also, I don't know if any of you have had been treated for TMJ and or clenching. The one thing we found is that the thicker the appliance, in other words, the taller it is, the more you tend to clench. And the more you tend to clench, you will actually rotate the, your, your cranium posteriorly, but it will cause increased activity in the superior middle pharyngeal constrictors and decrease your volume for uh, breathing. <clears throat> in other words, it will probably cause more good than it actually helps. Okay, so here, here we are with the forward head posture. Again, we're actually just showing you how they actually, the, the spine is vertical. And it again, for every two inches your head comes forward, it actually increases the strength, the, uh, the weakness in the ligaments and the muscles themselves. Um, this is for practitioners, the normal angulation of, um, of uh, the upper cervical spine is 101 degrees. Um, a straight cervical spine is 90, kyphotic inverted spine is 80 at 84 degrees. But keep in mind that you see the vertical line here, you see everything is straight. Everything should be in front of this line. So this is what we call a torticolic or a straight spine. Well, actually it will generate posterior head pain. And if you look right here where C1 is right against the skull and C2, this is where pain behind the ear comes from. And if you look between C1 or C0 and C1, that's where the head behind, behind your ear comes from. And between one and two, that's where the pain comes up the rear of your head. Uh, that's where we talk about the torticollis. And if you're talking about, whoops, torticollis is when you get straightening the C5, 6, and 7 right here. Okay. A direction okay here we are the torticollis and again when you're actually looking at the upper cervical uh, evaluation you talk about the crucial ligament the alar ligament the transverse ligament and we've talked about those okay Let's see if we can get going in the right direction here now this is just a posterior view of the ligaments themselves this is the alar ligament right here it goes across it actually holds <clears throat> the cruciate ligament on C1, the the uh, nans on C1, this is the cruciate ligament, and these are the ALR ligaments, okay? Now, there's one thing I'm going to throw in that people don't really understand, but dysautonomia is a situation where the autonomic processes in your body, in other words, your breathing, your GI tract, your heart rate, those situations are actually disrupted. And the one thing we figured out is that 
sometimes distortion in the area in the rear of the throat of your mouth will actually cause a dysautonomic response in other words so basically what happens is we have pharyngeal constrictors now this is the middle pharyngeal constrictor superior pharyngeal constrictor starts here and goes to the anterior portion of the throat so the superior pharyngeal constrictor if you could actually take your teeth and clench them and fuel right in front of the muscles in the side of your cheek, there's actually a void there, okay? And that void is where it starts. So superior pharyngeal constrictor actually starts in an area called the mentalis muscle, which is below your chin, and it attaches to the abicularis oris muscle, which is your kissing muscle, okay? And that goes to the buccinator muscle, which is right behind the angle of your lips. Now, the buccinator muscle integrates with the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle just at the uh, anterior portion of the master. So if you put your teeth together and clench right before the fat portion on the side of your jaw, you'll actually feel a void. And that's where the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle starts. And that's this muscle that starts right here and goes around the back of your pharynx and actually attaches the vertical portions of C1, 2, and 3. Now, the middle pharyngeal constrictor muscle actually comes from the hyoid bone and goes to the, the uh, um, anterior portion just below the foramen magnum at the basion. And this is the middle pharyngeal constrictor, and this goes to C4. So basically, C, the superior pharyngeal constrictor goes to C1, 2, and 3. Middle pharyngeal constrictor muscle goes to C4. So this is. I know it looks a little gross, but this is a horizontal view, the rear of your throat, okay? This is your trachea, and this is the posterior portion. This is your vertebrae, and this is the area around your tonsils. Now, there are a couple structures there that we should know about. We got the vagus nerve that goes through there. You got the accessory nerve. It goes to the back of your head. You got the hypoglossal nerve to your back of your tongue, the sympathetic trunk, the alar fascia, which goes to C2, the glossopharyngeal nerve, which goes to your tonsillary, the facial nerve that goes to your face, obviously, and the internal carotid artery. Gosh, this is a number of things that are in that area. So what would you expect if there's distortion of that area? Could you get compression of the vagus nerve? You could. Compression of the accessory nerve? You could do that, too. Sympathetic trunk? Hmm. So basically, the vagus nerve goes to your heart, your GI tract, your breathing. Uh, the sympathetic trunk has to go with the vasoconstrictors, again, of your uh, GI system, uh, gives you the tightening of the chest. Hypoglossal nerve is the area in the back of your throat. Uh, and the facial nerve actually is the area superior, middle, inferior portion of your face. In other words, above your eye, above your cheek, and along your jaw. And the internal carotid artery is your blood flow. Man, yeah, interesting. So what tends to happen is, is that when these structures are constricted, you'll actually get GI problems, a heart rate aberration, breathing aberration, everything that you wouldn't normally expect. Okay. Now let's move on to cervical cranial myofascial pain syndrome. This is my own syndrome. Okay. So basically what we're going to do is and this is really complex, but I'm going to make it as, as simple as we can. In other words, so we've talked about the mandibular position, the middle pharyngeal constrictor, the superior middle pharyngeal constrictor, and C1, 2, and 3. So basically what happens is when you change the position of the jaw, you can actually affect the cervical vertebrae. So, so you're sitting there watching this. Stick your lower jaw out as far as you can. You can feel the pull in your neck. Does everybody feel that? Basically, what happens is that connection between the superior pharyngeal constrictor and your chin actually will actually distort the vertebrae in your neck, C1, 2, and 3. Now, the, the middle pharyngeal constrictor will actually affect C4. So think about it. The position of your jaw affects the position of C1, 2, and 3. You talk about an EDS patient that has weak ligaments and or aberrant muscles. Think of what it can actually physically do to distort those areas. 
Think of what it can do to distort the rear of your throat in the vagus nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, in the internal carotid artery. Think about what it does to actually distort that. So believe it or not, it's all correlated. In other words, the jaw affects the neck, the neck affects the jaw. So what tends to happen is there's a couple of things that jump up and make you a little crazy. Another one, there's a muscle called the levator scapulae muscle. Now, what the heck is that? Now, basically, that goes from C2, which is the vertebrae that you can feel at the base of your spine, and that goes to C7, which is just above where your thoracic vertebrae start. That is the muscle that actually physically goes underneath your uh, scapula, in other words, your shoulder blade. So when you get tightness underneath that shoulder blade and pain on the lateral side of your neck, guess what? It's because of rotation of C2, C3, or any of the vertebrae in that line. It will cause spasm in the levator. Interesting. Is that where that pain comes from? Now, this is an idea of what it actually physically looks like. And here it is starting right here and going right underneath the shoulder blade right there. Now, what tends to happen along with that? Well, when C2 rotates, it usually takes C1 with it. So if you actually feel just behind the angle of your jaw, just below your rear, sometimes you can actually feel a bulge there. And that is the lateral process of C1. In other words, C2 rotates, it'll take C1 with it because C1 to actually, actually protrude to the side. Now, what happens is, there's a muscle that actually picks up just behind or below your ear, and you feel that piece of bone, and that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And that goes from that mastoid process down to what they call a suprasternal notch, which is above your breastbone. So that's the muscle that actually turns your head from side to side. So that'll cause a spasm in that. Hmm, that's interesting. So when my head's, so when my vertebrae is out, it can cause pain in the lateral side of my neck. Well, there's another muscle just around your trachea, right around your uh, vocal cords called the longus coli that actually is in conjunction with that sternocleidomastoid. And the, we talked about convergence before where pain and spasm in one can actually work over in the other. It'll cause that longus coli muscle also spasm. So you got pain on the lateral side of your neck, above your breastbone and along the side of your neck, all coming from the rotation of C2 and C1. Interesting. Okay. So there's another situation too, is when C2 rotates and C1 rotates, it'll actually cause a vertical compression. Basically what happens is, is that number one, C1 will actually approximate the base of your skull. In other words, it'll actually get closer to your skull. And that'll actually cause compression on what they call the lesser occipital nerve. And that's what gives you the pain behind the ear. And also between C1 and C2, there's a compression between on what they call the greater occipital nerve. And that's the one that gives the pain up the back of your head, over the top and over the eye and behind the eye, okay? So then that will actually put force on the trigeminal nerve, the first branch. Now, let's see, here we go. Here's the compression. It refers to the greater occipital nerve, which goes to the occipital muscle goes to the aponeurosis, which is a big piece of connective tissue, and it goes to the frontalis muscle, which gives you your wrinkles on your forehead. That will actually put pressure on the superior portion of the orbit, which actually puts pressure on the trigeminal nerve. So pain here can actually give you pain in the back of the head, the vertex, and or above the eye, and this will give you above the eye and behind the eye. And it's all coming from compression on C1 and C2. Interesting. So basically, here we are, we're talking about what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Can the mandibular function cause distortion of the, of the vertebrae, or can the vertebrae cause the man, mandible to, to, to misfunction? It can cause the contractions, it can cause the headaches, it can cause the pain, and it actually can cause areas that uh, to spasm that you would not even expect to be associated with this. So if you're talking about Mandibular positional change can cause vertebral change, which can cause rotation and compression of the occipital nerve and cause pressure behind the eye and behind the eye and above the eye and behind the eye. Who would ever assume that all this is correlated? Now, the position of the mandible will actually cause distortion of the TMJ, which will cause 
clicking and popping. Believe it or not, most of my patients, I would say in about 70% of the time, the distortion of the cervical vertebrae cause the mandible to distort and causes clicking and popping. I can actually physically rotate C1 and C2 back in position and clicking and popping and the jaw goes away. It's very interesting in the fact that um, a lot of oral surgeons will do surgery on this joint and in fact will get a minimal result um, and uh, just simply say that it has to do with the position of the bones and the action, the action of the mandible. Another thing we see, believe it or not, is we see a lot of orthodontics that are done without evaluation of the TM joint. In other words, the teeth are moved into a beautiful arrangement. They look gorgeous. The bite of C appears to be correct, but in fact, the ver cervical vertebrae in the position of the mandible was not stabilized before the orthodontics were done, and therefore the jaw and the teeth we're actually positioned in a situation where the discomfort in the, in the neck and the distortion was causing distortion in the mandible. Okay. Um, we tend to see this with uh, four by four by cuspid extractions, which is an old way of actually physically doing it. Now with the Invisalign and the, <laughs> those situations, it tends to happen less. So uh, as a closing statement, the chicken or the egg, does the jaw affect the neck? Does the neck affect the jaw? Does the neck affect the headaches? It's all correlated. So before you actually jump off any bridges, let's do the evaluations first and find out where we are. The um, stability of the TMJ is always related in a TEDS patients. In other words, I have yet to see an EDS patient that doesn't have some kind of TMJ instability. The mild position of the vertebrae will cause the, the uh, malocclusions, and jaw misalignment will cause skeletal referral pain. Simply put, this is where we are. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're due for questions. I know I gave you a lot of information, and it felt like an anatomy lesson, but a lot of times, this is what you need to actually understand it. And I do not assume that our EDS patients <coughs> are not informed. In fact, they're probably more informed than a lot of doctors we see. So pardon me, but I think it was very, very uh, necessary. Thank you very much. Jessica, it's all yours now. Thank you. We have, um, we do have some questions coming in and um, feel free to keep sending us questions and we'll get some of these answered. The first question we have is if someone has a Craniocervical fusion to correct CCI, how would that affect the TMJ? Okay, number one, what level was the fusion? Okay, if it's C1, 2, or 3, that tends to slow down the uh, situation with the CDI because of the fusion. Um, what we usually find out, though, is we can actually change the torsion um, with actually changing the position of the mandible. But what it does is it slows down our ability for, uh, quite a bit to actually position everything. Okay. Is splint treatment effective? Yes, it is. And what you're going to find out is that um, depends on what the situation is, but you can actually, believe it or not, resolve a popping, a cracking, actual do a stretching, positioning by the positioning of a splint. Yes, it is, and it's fairly necessary. Okay. How can we use this information to get better treatment from our doctors? Well, number one, the situation I get into is that a lot of dentists don't understand this, okay, because they were just never taught, simply put. I'm more than happy to talk to anyone and actually explain this to them on how it physically works. Basically, I have lectures online that the doctors can see, okay? Uh, and they can actually give them a basis for what we're talking about. But the cervical cranial instability is fairly paramount to position the mandible before you actually do orthodontics and or if you're looking for um, resolution of headaches. I, I hope that'll explain it to you. I'll be more than happy to talk to anybody about this. 
Uh, back to splinting, it says when you when you say change the position, does that mean splinting or surgery? Usually what happens is we try and do uh, the splinting to actually establish where we are. Uh, I haven't had a patient surgerized in 20 years. And what we've actually been able to do is when we change the position of the mandible and stabilize the upper cervical spine, we've actually been able to use orthodontics to actually stabilize the jaw. Or we have some patients that just wear the splinting at night that will actually stabilize it. Um, but like I said, we have not had a patient surgerized in 20 years. And we see 30 to 50 new head pain patients a month. So if you can imagine that many patients and no need to actually be surgerized. Are there any meds you prescribe like muscle relaxants that help TMJ? Hmm. Usually the one thing that we do, if you're se severe TMJ, we use a corticosteroid, usually a medrol dose pack initially to get you over the hump. But the, what the situation is, is that usually when you get a compression and or bone, def dome, bone um, uh, situation where the bone is actually starting to degrade, there's, everybody is a little bit different. Um, sometimes we'll use our muscle relaxants before you go to bed at night so you don't clench your teeth as much. Sometimes we'll use uh, uh, um, pain medication. Sometimes we'll use Motrin, but everybody's a little bit different. But we try and stay away from the high, uh, high power drugs. Can Botox or other injections help or trigger point shots? And can you do these with patients with hypermobility, EDS, and complex regional pain syndrome? The answer is yes, across the board. We use a lot of Botox. I mean, we use a phenomenal amount of Botox. Uh, we use it for migraines. We use it for, believe it or not, the same muscles in about two thirds of the situation, the same muscles that generate a migraine. Okay, so if you're talking about the masters, you're talking about the temporalis, you're talking about the base of the skull, you're talking about the muscles after cervical fusion. Uh, the answer is yes, Botox helps a phenomenal amount, but you have to know where to put it and how to use it. Okay, um, what were the other question? The other part of that question? Um, can it be used with CRPS? Yes, it can. It can. Um, the only limitations for the Botox are allergies to eggs, um, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, or Louis Dietz syndrome. Those are the three major counterindications. Um, we see probably uh, probably 15 to 20 Botox patients a week. And if I could actually, the running joke is if I could fill a bus up from patients from Maryland, I could fill it once a week with head pain patients and migraine patients. Man. Are there people who just can't tolerate appliances and can you still help them? The answer is yes, there are people who can't tolerate them, uh, the, but there are very few and far between. You can modify the appliances so that they're tolerable. And I've, I've actually <laughs> never had anybody that's actually not used one but you can actually modify it just the factors just cover the teeth themselves not actually affect the roof of the mouth or the throat or anything else okay. um we have a, we have a few questions here about the different kinds of braces and splints um what kind of braces and splints do you recommend is upper or lower bite splints better um and just some general information about more about what splints are and how they're used and what kind Okay, basically I use I use an upper splint usually, okay, and about 95% of the time, okay. Um, basically, it has to do with the length of the jaw, the position of the jaw, but usually the upper splint will do what it's supposed to do. Depending on what the situation is, whether it's a pure compression, it's a rotation, or if it's an, a posterior compression of the condyle, um, <clears throat> a lot of times you can actually vertically open the joint, you can actually move the entire mandible forward to reposition and or capture the cartilage. Um, you can actually physically use it to stabilize the cervical spine. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do, but the biggest trick to this whole thing is you can't make them too thick. 
remember we talked about the thicker the appliance, the more you clench. Basically, if you make a thick appliance or what they call a remedies, it actually tends to make the situation, believe it or not, worse because of the clenching increase. It'll actually close the airway, make breathing harder, cause the jaw to retrude. There's a lot of things, so you may have to keep them in a minimal height. Okay. Well, that's all I can tell you because everybody's different. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, Jess. Have you noticed that cervical collars aggravate TMJ, and what is the solution for this, if so? Okay, cervical collars, basically, we see a lot of patients that have had cervical fusions. Number one, you can't get around that, okay? They have to support it. Number two, what you're going to find out <clears throat> is that uh, the position of the head and the neck, sometimes, depending on the strength of the head and neck, is supported by the cervical collar. In fact, there are some patients, especially the ones that drive long ways to see me, I actually tell them to use a cervical collar to stabilize <clears throat> the cervical spine. Once I put the, usually rotate, I, in my patients, I actually show them how to physically do a physical therapy move to position the upper cervical vertebrae usually. And once we do that, I like to make sure that it stays in place. And that's why we use a cervical collar for support. Sometimes, sometimes it'll make people crazy, but it usually works. Okay, go ahead. Um, on that note, we had a question about physical therapy. Is physical therapy or chiropractic treatment something to consider as part of treatment, and how does all that work? Okay, what basically happens is, is that um, the physical therapy itself, um, I will, I actually, in this part of the country, I'm just north of Cincinnati, I actually struck physical therapist from Sandusky to Cincinnati on how to actually physically do cervical positioning. Okay, it, the, the situation, there's a specific um, PT system that you actually can rotate those vertebrae back in. Um, what we've taught a few people in the uh, um, Marietta, Ohio area, um, and some people down in uh, Florida, but uh, it's a specific move, and once we show you how to do it, it works very, very well. Uh, as far as chiropractic goes, uh, I recommend no high-speed velocity of positioning of the upper cervical spine. Uh, if you're going to use any type of system, the neutral system uh, used in chiropractic it would be the system to do, but I'm more than happy to talk to anyone and tell them how and show them how to actually physically rotate those vertebrae back in in a very gentle and uh, passive way of doing it, okay. Can TMJ ever cause or result in some hearing loss? The answer is it can, okay. Now, well, the thing most people don't realize is the back of this joint and the anterior portion of your middle ear are sometimes a half a millimeter apart. And bone being bone, not metal, it's porous. So swelling and inflammation in the back of the joint can actually affect the inner ear itself and actually slow down the actions of the hammer anvil stapes and or uh, injure the uh, auditory nerve itself. The answer is yes. Who do you send EDS patients to for wisdom tooth extraction? Ah, that's, that's interesting. Usually, what usually happens is we usually use a oral surgeon in your area, but I talk to them before they actually physically do it, okay, because there's certain things. Number one, the bone is very friable. In other words, it will actually become infected and uh, heal very slowly. That's one. Number two, you tend to hemorrhage like crazy. Number three, the tissue will, when you go to suture and close the area, the tissue is very brittle. So there's a lot of things that I actually tell the oral surgeons to keep an eye on and actually affect um, having to support your jaw before they actually put the leverage on to remove the teeth. There's a lot of things that I can actually tell them how to actually physically do to make things come out a little bit better. Okay. I have a dislocated larynx. Do the larynx and jaw at all interact? Uh, can they cause complications between the two or are they unrelated? Uh, they are 
sometimes they are related, sometimes they aren't. So a lot of times the larynx dislocation has to do with the, uh, the, um, the ligaments and or the position of the trachea and or position of the cervical spine and or position of the jaw itself. Everybody is a little bit different in this situation, but what tends to happen is the position of the cervical spine will actually help stabilize the larynx itself. Uh, you got to make sure that the sternocleidomastoid muscles are in position and the longest coli position muscles and the stylohyoid muscles are all in position. A lot of times the stylohyoid ligaments will actually cause rotation and or flexion of the trachea. Everybody is a little bit different, but the answer is yes, it can affect it. We have a couple of people asking, do you know of any specialists on the West Coast that you referred to? Um, either fortunate or unfortunately, I'm the only one that does this. I hate to say it. Um, I, I know a couple of specialists on the West Coast, but they do just specific with TMJ, they don't understand the rest of the system. So um, I'm a diplomat with the American Academy of Cranial Facial Pain. There's about 115 of us in the world. And of the 115, when you actually go to them with the EDS patients, they all point towards me. <laughs> so unfortunately, I see a lot of people from Carlsbad, California, from San Francisco. Um, unfortunately, I, I hate to say it, but I'm about it. Is TMJ easier to treat post CCI fusion? Um, no, it's not. Uh, let's put it this way: we can we can treat it, but it uh, actually makes things a little tougher. Generally. Uh, what kind of treatment for dysautonomia is recommended that you mentioned in your presentation? For dysautonomia, basically what happens is that the, uh, number one, what we do is we actually, it's a combination of things. Number one, we actually position the mandible so that the joint actually works the way it's supposed to. Uh, we'll actually um, decrease the amount of uh, muscle tension in the superior constrictor in the masseters themselves. Uh, will actually decrease the amount of uh, constriction in the pharynx itself. Number three, we'll actually take C1 and C2 and actually put them back in position, which actually tends to take the tension off the rear of the posterior uh, of the laryngeal area. Uh, pharyngeal area, I'm sorry. And uh, it will tend to actually relax it. And when that relaxes, Believe it or not, the stomach will settle down, the breathing will settle down, the heart rate will settle down. It'll actually decrease the amount of tension in that posterior pharyngeal area, which actually decreases the compression on the vagus nerve, the sympathetic trunk, the glossopharyngeal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and usually it happens about two thirds of the time and it tends to help. What if the jaw opening is, um, is wide rather than narrow? Okay, well, that's one of those things where we call that stupid human tricks. You can open your mouth to 70, 75 millimeters, and you show, show people by sticking your fist in your mouth, things like that. You're eventually gonna, going to injure the joint. So the answer is, do not show people that you can open your mouth that wide. And it just means that you're hyperflexible and the ligaments can actually be distorted quite a bit. And you're probably dislocating the joint when you go to full opening. You're probably dislocating it by about 10 to 12 millimeters. Well, it is about that time. We have we have time for one more question, and then we're going to wrap it up here. Um, mm. Do you see tinnitus in these patients, and can you help them? The answer is yes, we do see tinnitus. Unfortunately, there's about a half different, half dozen different causes for the tinnitus. It can be everything from uh, blood flow to the auditory nerve to compression of the mastoid process, to uh, inflammation of the inner ear itself, inflammation of the back of the joints. There's about a half different, half dozen different things that cause the tinnitus. What tends to happen though, is that about a third of the time when we get the mandible in the right position, the tinnitus will decrease, but you can't give it a specific region. I mean, there's, there's uh, supplements that people sell. I mean, there's, head position, jaw position, everything else that they talk about. But unfortunately, 
for a specific cause and or cure, you've got about a half dozen things you have to take a look at. Thank you so much for everything, Dr. Mikadis. This is, a, I think, everything went really well. It, there's a lot of helpful information here. We have a lot of people who are sending in not questions but comments, saying thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you. For those of you who came in late, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our website in the, in the next few days. Also, be on the lookout for our next webinar in our series. That announcement will be made in the next few days as well. Thank everyone for thank you everyone for attending and you all have a great day.